Inference for Linear Regression. In this program, we're going to continue to work with the linear regression model that we introduced in the program Examining Relationships. Only now our focus is on making statistical inference for regression. So we'll learn how to test the significance of our regression model by running a t-test for slope. We'll also learn how to obtain and interpret the f-test results for model significance. Finally, we'll look at the stepwise multiple regression method. And then once we get a corrected model, we'll learn how to use forecasting intervals to apply the model. To demonstrate how we would test the significance of our slope and the overall model significance, we can use a simple linear regression. Here I'm going to create the regression equation that can be used to predict the amount charged with a cardholder's income. So my independent variable is income and my amount charged is my dependent variable. If we click on the result sheet, inference 1, the p-value of 0 0.0000 as well as the very strong t-stat of 7.12 tells me that this regression is highly significant. So I could report my results as t for 75 degrees of freedom equals 7.12, p equals 0 0.0000, which is clearly highly significant. So I could say p is less than 0.01. The confidence interval also tells me that this is a highly significant regression. I'm 95% confident that the population slope beta 1 is somewhere in the interval between 9.7 and 17.255. In addition to telling me what the population slope probably is, this confidence interval clearly does not contain the value zero. So it's like saying I'm 95% confident that the population slope is not zero. In other words, it's saying that I'm 95% confident that there is a true linear relationship between income and amount charged. The F-test, even for a simple linear regression, is still valid. I could report the overall model significance using the results of my F test. Only here I would say that F for the degrees of freedom 1, 75 equals 50.65 and P equals 0 0.0000 which is clearly less than 0.01 so we have a highly significant model. These two p-values will always be exactly the same when we're running a simple regression. Therefore, we could report either result and get the same information. So it seems pretty simple to work with a simple linear regression model, but what if we had more than one explanatory variable? We're going to use a method called stepwise multiple regression. We'll begin by entering all explanatory variables that we have. And in steps, we'll remove the least significant, that is the highest insignificant p-value, and then rerun the regression, or what we call refit the model. We'll then learn how to run a collinearity check and a residual plot check. And once we have a corrected model, we'll then look back at how to apply that model using our forecasting intervals. Now let's look at that multiple regression case. If we were to follow those steps and start by entering all of the independent variables that we have. Here we have income, household size, age, and we've recoded gender into an indicator variable and we've done the same with ad level. So now we have just zeros and ones in my gender 
and ad level data. It's important to note that the actual genders or the actual ad levels would not work on our multiple regression. So we would input variables 1, 2, 6, 7, and 8. And our dependent variable, of course, would be the same amount charged. Clicking the worksheet tab inference 2, I get my results. So I'm going to start with the collinearity check, because if there is too much collinearity between two or more of the variables, I'm going to have to make some variable selection decisions based on that first. So I see here that age and income have a strong positive correlation. Remember here our rule is 0.7. When we check for collinearity, if the correlation is more extreme than 0.7 or negative 0.7, and by more extreme, we mean closer to 1 or closer to negative 1. Then we would say there is possibly a problem with collinearity, and we'd make a decision to remove one of those collinear variables. Here, my first step would be to remove age. That high p-value is occurring because of its correlation with income. So if I remove age and then move up variables 7 and 8, this is my first corrected model. So now my collinearity check is fine. If I look through all the correlations, I would find none that are more extreme than 0.7. So right now, my equation produces an adjusted R-squared of about 80%. The stepwise process will help me clean up some of these insignificant p-values in my table of t-test results for slope. The first one that I would remove is gender 2 because it has the highest p-value. So I'm going to remove and refit using only variables 1, 2, and 8. So I'm managing to keep that adjusted R squared at or around 80%. And I've successfully removed one insignificant p-value from my model. But I still have another. Ad level is still not working on this model. And the high p-value of 0.1651 tells me that. So the last step in correcting this model stepwise would be to remove it. Now I can report that the regression equation y hat equals the intercept plus the slope times income plus the slope times household size is the equation that I could use to predict amount charged with income and household size. Further, the model is highly significant. F for 2, 74 degrees of freedom is a very strong 154.6. And the p-value is 0 to many more than 4 places. Clearly, the model is highly significant overall. And my adjusted R-squared is holding at about 80%. But before I make a final decision and report the results of my final model, I want to be careful to check my residual plot. Remember, on the residual plot, I'm looking for that consistent box-like pattern above and below the zero line. And I see that with nearly all of the data, but there are a couple of the cases that seem to be outlying. These are cases that would deviate from the overall trend produced by the bulk of our data. And we might adjust our model at the data level by attempting to remove these cases from the data and then refitting the model. If I were to do that in this case, 
I might find that I could get gender or ad level to work on this model. Age is not going to work with income because of the collinearity, but gender might work on the model if we address the outliers, or ed level might work on the model. I've done a considerable amount of statistical testing prior to the model building stage. All of my statistical tests showed that ed level did not have a significant effect on spending. However, some of my tests showed that gender did. So I might continue to work with this model in an effort to maintain or even increase the adjusted R squared by targeting deviations on the residual plot and working at the data level. Then I could try to reintroduce the gender variable to see if I could achieve statistical significance. So it takes a little bit of effort to get to that corrected model and we could look at the variable selection and then using the residual plot we can get down to the data level to try to fine-tune our model and make the best possible model we can. But all of this is aimed at making forecasts. So we have two main tools. One is called a prediction interval and the other is called a confidence interval and we're going to look at both of those now. Once I have my final multiple regression model, I want to use my model in the way it's intended, and that is as a predictive model. So we have two different forecasting tools. One is the prediction interval and one is the confidence interval. For example, if the income is 129,000, which is about average, and if the household size is 3.4, which also is about average, I would predict at 95% confident that a credit card holder that's about average is going to spend somewhere in this range from 3105.39 to about 4788.18. And that's a forecast for an individual card holder with an income of 129 and a household size of 3.4. Now, the confidence interval will give me a little bit of a different forecast. I'm 95% confident that given these demographics, in other words, given that a cardholder is average demographically, the confidence interval tells me at 95% confidence that the average amount spent for all average cardholders will be somewhere in the much narrower range between 3851.51 and 40.42 and 6 cents. The confidence interval is for a mean response and the prediction interval for an individual response. It's important to note that in the previous example, we just used one set of given values. We used an income of 129 and a household size that's average at 3.1. We're certainly not limited to making one forecast. Here we're trying to estimate the average amount charged or for an individual cardholder the amount charged given average demographics. But it might also be useful to say look at the lower quartile of income and the lower quartile of household size or the upper quartile of income, the upper quartile of household size. All of this is going to give us an idea of the effects that income and household size might have on the amount charged and we'll get a table of results that will give us a range of outcomes for a different possibility of demographic information. This concludes the program Inference for Linear Regression.